it installed. I'm not sure. Is it on? Reason, reason maybe there's an on off button. And you are right. All right. Oh. It's loud. All right. Uh, so this presentation is on bandwidth-based load balancing with failover. Uh, it's got the easy way in its name, but uh, well, we'll see later. <laughs> All right. So we had a great presentation for providers and big networks with BGP, and we had a great presentation by Steve uh, yesterday about PCC load balancing. So this will be a little bit different. All right, so about me, my name is Thomas Kurnak. I'm from Slovakia, I work for a company named Atris. We've been around since 1991. We do complete IT solutions, networking servers, IP security systems. I personally do mostly servers and virtualization, but I love networking. And uh, yeah, Microtech certified trainer as well. So load balancing, and this ties back into Steve's presentation. Uh, so what is it and why would we want it? So the definition is load balancing is distributing workload across multiple network links to maximize throughput and minimize latency, which everybody wants, right? And uh, also, using this, we can actually achieve redundancy. So the most common load balancing times are either bonding or policy routing or PCC or some kind of bandwidth-based balancing. With bonding, it's really easy. Uh, you just, for example, uh, if you have a server with a gigabit connection and then you only have a switch with a 100 megabit connection in between, you can actually bond these 200 megabit connections to get an aggregate 200 megabit throughput. Uh, it's really easy to implement. It's got automatic redundancy with automatic failover. The only downside is that you actually need control of both ends of the link to implement this because it either has to do with uh, the load, uh, the LACP protocol or some other way. And that's not really useful if you are taking internet from your ISP because it's not going to let you mess with their end of the link. Uh, you can do policy routing, which basically says, you know, this group of machines goes through the ISP1 link and this group of machines goes through the ISP2 link. It's really easy to implement as well and you have exact control of your traffic because you know which side of your network is going out which network, which ISP. Uh, the problem with this is it's not dynamic. You actually have to make sure and you actually have to yourself manually assign which parts of your network are going out which of your ISPs and scalability problems, obviously, because you have to configure everything yourself. If you add a new ISP, then you have to reassign a lot of your network to go out of that ISP and again, it's not dynamic. So then we have PCC, which was covered yesterday. And basically, uh, your router looks at all the connections coming from your network and then assigns them to certain ISP links, like connection one, ISP one, connection two, ISP two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with PCC, it is also understandably easy to configure. It's got great scalability because you can simply just add another ISP and add one more mango rule and there you go. Uh, the problem of PCC is mostly that it's not aware of link state, bandwidth wise. What I mean by this is that if one link is already at full capacity, PCC is still going to assign new connections to that link, even if it's at full capacity. Also, it's not so great with very unsimilar links. If you have a link with four megabits and then a second link with one megabit, so it's a four to one uh, connections that you have, PCC is going to assign new connections to the one megabit link, even if the four megabit link is completely unutilized. So why should my connection be going out through the slow link if the fast link is still not completely utilized, right? All right, so yes, all these uh, load balancing uh, methods were already covered, and you can just go to TickTube and look for PL 2010 and 2012 presentations. They are on there. Also, Steve's presentation is going to be on TikTube. So we have another alternative, which is bandwidth-based load balancing. And it's really simple. If the interface ISP1 is over 10 megabits, use ISP2. But if there is free capacity on the ISP1 link, use ISP1. So 
it's very well scalable because you can add links and it just works. Uh, takes link status into consideration, which is great because it's only going to route the connections out of the second ISP only if first ISP is already overloaded. And you actually have not full, but you have uh, partial control over your connections because you know that connections are going out ISP1 until it's at its limits. It's not random like PCC. And yes, you can actually decide when you want to switch to the second link. For example, if you have a 10 megabit link on the ISP1, and, but you might want to switch to the second ISP after the first ISP is at 50% utilization. It's just an example, but you can actually do it. And yes, load balancing comes with its own problems, which are implementation considerations. There are multiple ways to do bandwidth-based load balancing. MPLST, MPLS traffic engineering, don't worry, this presentation is not about MPLS, you don't have to get scared. Uh, or you can do a bit of mangling and scripting. Uh, Yanis has a great presentation about MPLS traffic engineering on PL2012 on TickTube. So yes, we are going to uh, focus on mango and scripting to achieve our, uh, our load balancing. All right, so underlying technologies. Uh, this is just going to be a quick review since Steve already covered all of the underlying basics which we should understand. So connections and tracking them. This is how the connection table looks like in router OS. What is important is this, that you actually have connection tracking enabled. I don't understand, well, I guess I understand, but lots of people actually turn connection tracking off. Uh, so you have to have it enabled for Mangle to work. All right, so what is a connection? Uh, we can define a connection as a packet flow with the same pair of source and destination IP addresses and ports. Yes, UDP doesn't have connections, so it would be a UDP stream. Please don't get so technical with me. All right, so. Uh, for example, a connection from my local machine on this port to Google DNS would be a connection and all the packets that would be returning from Google's DNS back to my computer on this source port uh, would still be considered a part of this connection. So we know that something is a part of a connection when it actually fits all these parameters. So Mangle. Mangle is a facility in router OS which allows us to mark packets. We can then do whatever we want with these packets later based on these marks. Also very important is that the mango marks do not leave the router. Don't worry, we are not messing with any standards. We are not messing up headers, etc. It's just inside of the router. All right, so mango is really easy. Just open IP, firewall, and mango. Routing tables. So a routing table tells the router which next hop to forward packets to depending on the packet's destination IP. So like this default route, so for all packets, forward them to 7721.33.12. This is an example uh, routing table. So you can see I have a default route, I have some connected routes, and uh, by default, uh, all packets are put into the main routing table. You can see that if a routing table doesn't have a mark, it's considered the main routing table. But obviously we can create our own routing tables and then use them for our needs. So we can actually force packets to go through certain routing tables. So for example, if a packet is in the default, if the, in the main routing table, it's going to go to this uh, default gateway through the PPP WAN interface. But if I force the packet into the example routing table, it's going to be routed to this gateway. So our uh, topology that we are going to use for the rest of this presentation is really simple. We've got two ISPs, we've got our router, and then the rest of the network is after our router. So what do we need to do to enable all of this? Uh, we need to create our routing tables, we need to set up some address lists, then we need to set up Mangle and configure some traffic monitoring and a bit of scripting. So basic configuration, we simply have our LAN interface, two ISP interfaces, we have our addresses on ISP1 and ISP2 and on our LAN, and then we are masquerading. Uh, this load balancing is only for netted networks, 
So this is not for your huge ISP implementations. If you are offering public IP space, this is not going to work. This only works with private IP space. All right, so we're going to add some routes. Basically, we add a new gateway, a default route to this gateway with distance one, and another default route to this gateway with distance two. Uh, so why the different distances? Well, this goes into ECMP and other things, but uh, uh, preferably you want your packets to always take a certain uh, direction and only go there, and only if this route goes down, then we can actually send packets to uh, this gateway. Simple failover. And then we are going to create uh, uh, some uh, custom routing tables. So we are going to create a separate routing table with the name of ISP1 route for ISP, and a separate routing table with ISP2 for uh, the second ISP. This is how it looks in the GUI, or in Winbox. Uh, you can see that we have the default, uh, or the main routing table, which has two default routes, and our connected routes, and then we have our custom-made routing tables, one for each ISP. All right, so first we need to take care of our connected networks. As you can see, routes for our connected networks, which actually hold our IP addresses, are only reachable in the main routing table. As you can see, the ISP1 route and ISP2 route routing tables have just default routes. They don't actually hold our connected routes into them. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that traffic to our connected networks stays in the main routing table. All right, so let's get into some technical stuff. First, we will create an address list, which we will call connected, and add our subnets into it. This goes back into the uh, basic IP addressing we did at the start. So we add all our directly connected subnets to this list, and then we also create an address list named LAN, which is only our local network, which we are going to use later. And we do some basic mangling. So in the chain pre-routing, when there is traffic from our local connected networks to our local connected networks, we are just going to accept this traffic. What accept means is that the packet is not going to be processed anymore. It's simply going to be accepted right there. So with this, we've got our connected networks covered. And if we just ping from inside of our LAN to the directly connected network of ISP1 or 2, it's going to work, and it's not going to break. So in this topology, uh, we have four possible uh, traffic flows. The internet can communicate through, to our router through either ISP, and then our router can go out to the internet through either ISP. Also, the internet can communicate to the inside of our local network if we are doing uh, you know, port address translations, if we are offering public services which are netted inside of our private IP space. So the internet can communicate to the inside of our LAN through either one ISP or the other ISP, and our LAN can go out to the internet through either of the ISPs as well. So taking care of incoming connections. When a connection from the internet is initiated to us, we need to ensure that these connections are replied through through the same ISP, from the same public IP. Otherwise, the connection would break. So we need to mark these connections, which are coming to us, and we need to put them into proper routing tables. So if a connection is coming from the internet to us through ISP1, we need to respond back to the internet through ISP1. There are some cases, yes, when this doesn't actually have to be like so, but for the most part, uh, this is how it should be. So let's first catch these connections in Mangle. So on the, we are now going to take care of the router when the internet is communicating to our router. So in Mangle, on input to the router, for new connections, connection mark of no mark is only on new connections or connections that are not marked yet. And if it's incoming on ISP's one interface, we are going to mark this connection with this mark. Then one, two, uh, two router OS. And then the same thing for the second ISP. In input for new connections with no mark, on incoming interface ISP2, we are going to mark it as when two, two, ROS, router OS. 
So then we've got these connections marked, and now we can do whatever we want this, with these connections based on these markings. So we are going to put these connections into their proper routing tables according to the marking. So this is, again, if a connection is initiated from the internet to our router, we have already caught that connection and marked it. So now in the chain output, when the router responds to this connection, we can say that in the chain output, for connections which are already marked as VAN1 to RouterOS, we can put them into the ISP1 routing table. And then the same thing again from, for the second ISP. In output, for the connections VAN2 to RouterOS, mark them and put the, uh, uh, mark the routing, therefore putting them into the proper routing table. All right, so we've, got, we've taken care of our router. Now we need to take care of our LAN. The same principle applies to our LAN. If a connection from internet is initiated to the inside of our LAN, it needs to be responded through the same ISP as the connection was initiated from. So we do basically the same thing here. I know it's a lot of text, but this is one of those exercises when you actually have to get home and put it into your router and see how it works. But it works. So in the chain forward, when there is a new connection incoming on the ISP's one interface, we are going to mark it as VAN1 to our local area networks. Same thing for ISP2. In the chain forward, new connections incoming on ISP2, uh, we are going to mark them as VAN2 to our local networks. And then again, in pre-routing, for these marked connections, and for packets which are only originating from our local network, because we don't want to mess with packets which are coming from internet to us, we just want to influence the packets coming from us back to the internet and make sure they're in the proper routing table. So for these connections from our local network, put them into the ISP1 routing table. And the same thing for ISP2, for connections which are already marked and which we know are from the ISP2's network to our LAN, and mark them and put them in the proper routing table. So we are basically done with connections initiated from the internet to us. So if anybody from the internet initiates a connection either to our router or to the inside of our LAN, it will work. The connection won't break and we'll be able to properly respond through both ISPs. All right, so what about connections from our LAN to internet? Because these are the connections we actually want to load balance. Well, first we need to explain uh, what a sticky connection is. So a sticky connection is a connection that once established through one interface will always go out this certain interface. Uh, this is required uh, because when we switch to a second link to load balance, we want the connections which are already going out through one link to stay going out through that one link. Otherwise the connection would break again. So in PCC this is done automatically router takes care of it automatically in the PCC process, but using this approach, we actually have to do all this manually. All right, so let's do some angling. So in the chain pre-routing, for new connections which are not marked yet, which are originating from our local area network, and they are not going to the connected networks, because we already took care of our connected networks, and they are not going to the router itself, because we don't want to mess with those connections. They are just from our LAN to our router. They are not going to the internet, therefore we don't care about them. We are going to mark them as LAN to VAN. Anybody has any questions about this? Feel free to ask any time. All right, so we have marked our connections which are originating from our LAN and are going to the internet. Nowhere else, only to the internet. So then we are going to force these connections in the chain pre-routing for these connections and originating from our LAN, we are going to put them into the ISP1 routing table. And this is actually where load balancing is going to happen. With just these two lines of configuration, we can now manually load balance, kind of, because we don't have sticky connections yet. But if we change this to ISP2 route, it means that all the connections from our local network will now going to go out to the internet through ISP2. So just like this, we can actually manually choose which ISP we are going to use. 
All right. So let's get on with the sticky connections, and this is where it gets a bit tricky. So in the chain pre-routing, for the connections which we have already marked with ISP1 route, we mark them as sticky connections. I'm going to explain all of this in a moment. And then do the same for the ISP2 routes, uh, for the connections which are going out through ISP2. Then, for these sticky connections, put them into their proper routing tables. So what does this do for us? This basically just ensures that con uh, connections which already passed through these rules are not caught anymore by these rules. So what this actually does now is that if we change manually this routing, only new connections will go out to the changed default gateway. What this does is actually allow us, you know, sticky connections. If a connection goes out through ISP1, and whatever else we do here, it's always going to go out through ISP1. Any questions? All right, well, hopefully everybody understands, or just everybody's given up on me by now. All right, so this is how your mango table should actually look in Winbox with all the proper, and don't worry, this presentation will be on TikTok, so you can just copy paste and try it. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And I've added comments as well, so we can actually see what happens where. All right, so what's the final result here now, after all this mangling and routing and everything? Basically, we can load balance manually now. What happens is then when a new connection comes to a router, it gets put out the ISP1 interface. But if we switch the routing, or if we tell the router to put new connections out ISP2, all the connections that already started on ISP1 are going to stay there. And this is kind of what we want, right? So load balancing, basically. Because connections, one established through ISP1, are always going to stay there, and we can decide when we want to switch to ISP2. But ideally, this would be automated, of course. So automating this is really simple based on bandwidth. We just create a new traffic monitor. You can find it in tools, traffic monitor. And we specify that for the interface ISP1, when received traffic, when download for our customers, is above five megabits, we will put a little log message to know that load balancing is happening, and then we will switch all the new connections to go through the second ISP. As you can see, all this little script does is just looks for the uh, mango rule with this comment, and then switches it to ISP2. And then switching back, once the traffic on interface ISP1 again, we are talking about download, is again below five megabits. We will put a little log message so we know that load balancing happened, and we will uh, send new connections back through ISP1. So the final result now is that connections are routed to the internet through ISP1 until ISP1 is at five megabits. Until that link is utilized, we know that the new connections are going out through ISP1. But once ISP1 is at 5 megabits, all the new connections will go out through ISP2 until, again, ISP's one link is under 5 megabit utilization. So, automated bandwidth-based load balancing. And now I get back to the start. Uh, I know the uh, presentation has the easy way in its name. What I mean by easy way is not that it's, that it's not the MPLS traffic engineering way. Uh, basically, this is actually really simple. Once you play with it, you can deploy this in a script in like five minutes. And uh, we have this employed with uh, five links doing uh, bandwidth-based load balancing, and it works great. All right, so what's our time here? Oh, we're, we're yeah, about, about to finish. Uh, failover. So the easiest way to do failover in uh, routerless is simply for your route, check the uh, check gateway into ping. What this will do is simply router will automatically ping your default gateway every so often, 
And if the gateway doesn't respond, it will invalidate this route. What's great about this is that you only have to do it once, because once a certain route becomes invalid, it becomes invalid in all routing tables. You don't have to do it for every single route you have. Uh, but yeah, this has potential problems. Obviously, if, uh, if a link failure happens after the default gateway, and you can still ping the default gateway, but you can't get through the internet through this default gateway, it's going to be a problem. Because routers will think that you have connectivity on that link, but you really don't. And there is multiple ways how to deal with this. The, you can either do a recursive uh, route lookup and actually resolve your routes recursively through, for example, Google or OpenDNS, and then validate the routes depending if uh, this recursive route responds or not. Uh, there are presentations on this as well on TikTube. You can do netwatch with scripting, etc. Uh, or you can do it with scripts only. If you are interested, I have a script on Wiki, which we use. Uh, it's rather long and complicated, but it's easy to set up. Uh, you can go and look at it and uh, figure out which of these ways is the best for you. All right, so that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, I have one more slide. I, I found this image yesterday, and I just, I just couldn't not put it in here. So what part of all of this don't you understand? So uh, feel free to find me after the presentation for any questions. And actually, I think we have a bit of time so we can do questions. All right. So feel free to ask any questions. Here we go. If you um, start getting more than two connections, doesn't the scripting start getting, how do you work it to keep the load balancing working on more than oh, two you connections? Simply, you simply have multiple uh, traffic monitor scripts. You can traffic monitor each interface, and then depending on the status of the previous traffic monitor, it gets a little bit complicated. Yes, as I said, this is not really the easiest way to do it, but it works. You can have up to, I don't, you can even have 10 interfaces load balancing like this. You just have to make sure that the uh, traffic monitor chain is set up properly. That's all. But you can do all crazy things uh, with this setup. You can actually load balance depending on the upload status of the link, and it just depends on how you set up the traffic monitors. That's all. Anybody else? Yeah. What would be the process automatically after the second line fills up? Sorry? Oh, the ISP2? When that, that fills up with the bandwidth, what, what's the automatic process that router is going to be doing? In this example, when ISP2 link is at full utilization, nothing happens. The connections still stay there. Uh, so the new users would be, would be going on to the, the stronger link? Oh, well, that depends on the state of ISP1 link. If ISP1 link is at full utilization, all new connections will be routed through ISP2. But once ISP1 drops back, below 5 megabit utilization, this is in the uh, traffic monitor script, all the new connections will get routed through ISP1 again. But the connections which were already put on the ISP2 links will stay there because of connection sticking. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I, I actually have one question. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what if the, uh, so for some kind of reason ISP1 uh, doesn't support five megabits at some time. It supports only four. Oh, you can specify uh, whatever you like in the traffic monitor script. Uh, but if that is un unexpected, then uh, uh, the new connections... Oh, yes, that's a problem. You actually need to know what your ISP support, because if uh, you have the traffic monitor scripts configured for five megabits and ISP1 is only giving you four and ISP1 is cutting you off, the scripts are not going to kick in. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's just one of the disadvantages of bandwidth-based load balancing. You actually need to be sure at what bandwidth to switch. But you, know, you can switch even if you are getting 5 megabits from ISP1. There is nothing stopping you from switching connections to ISP2 if the link is at 50% utilization, for example. You can specify the traffic monitoring script to switch to ISP2 after 2.5 megabit of utilization, even if you have a 5 megabit link. 
it, uh, obviously you need to test this and set it up for yourself depending on, on your setup. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, if there are not any more questions, um, if anybody is good with scripting and actually wants to have some fun, this script is still work in progress. It, it is working, but there are some features which are not implemented into it yet. So if you're good with scripting and want to have some fun, uh, check out the script and uh, let me know. And yeah, we can have some scripting fun. All right, thank you.